Hey, what's up you lot, Path here. In today's video, I want to share with you a neat little idea that's prevalent in the world of physics and also helps us answer a really important question. How is it that really counterintuitive theories, theories like relativity or quantum mechanics, happen to be the ones that best describe our universe? Or perhaps the better way to think about it is, why are these theories so counterintuitive to us in the first place? Luckily, we can use some very basic mathematics to help us understand what's going on here. And don't worry, as always, you only need to know like high school level maths to follow this video. So if you enjoyed this video, then please do leave a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. I'd like to start with an analogy and bear with me here. I'll promise it'll be worth it. And if at any point you get bored of the analogy or you don't want to sit through an analogy, then you can skip to this timestamp here. But anyway, let's imagine that every morning we take the train to work exactly the same train every morning, let's say the one that departs the station nearest to our house at four minutes past eight every day. Now this just happens to be a train that heads all the way into the city center, but we don't take it all the way into the city center. We obviously get off at the stop that happens to be nearest to our workplace, which we can say is only a couple of stops down the line from our home stop. So every morning we take the 0804 train a couple of stops to our workplace. And because we're scientists and because we're bored of sitting on the train every single day, we decide to do a little experiment. Nothing too complicated, just a little qualitative experiment. We decide to see how busy the train is every morning. And taking this train every day, we notice a pattern. The train isn't really busy between when we get on and when we get off. So we devise a little model in our heads. The 0804 train is not a particularly busy train. And all is well and good until one day we have to head into the city center for some reason. We take the train out of the stop nearest our house and we head all the way to the end of the line. And we're absolutely flawed because even though the train isn't busy once again between our home stop and our work stop, as soon as we get closer to the city center, the train gets busier and busier. Our little model that we created earlier, the idea that the 0804 train is not a busy train is gone out the window. That model is utterly shattered and it's shattered by the new evidence that we've gathered, taking the train further than we normally would have. In other words, we've put ourselves in a scenario that's outside our day to day experience. Normally we'd get off at the stop nearest to our workplace, but this time we went all the way along to the end of the line. And because of this, we've seen the full picture. I want you to bear this in mind because this is going to become important later on in the video. But for now, let's make a rather abrupt jump to some concrete physics. Let's talk about momentum for a second. Momentum is a physical quantity that an object can have that depends on the motion or movement of that object. If you study physics in high school, then you'll remember that the momentum of an object is defined as the mass of that object multiplied by the velocity with which it moves. But this is the classical physics definition, the one agreed on for hundreds and hundreds of years until Einstein came along with his special relativity and ruined it. Special relativity tells us that an object's momentum can be found with this monstrous expression. It's not really monstrous, it's actually quite cool. Uh, the V is obviously the velocity of the object, the M is the mass of the object, and C happens to be the speed of light. In relativity, the speed of light is almost a scaling factor, the thing that all other velocities are compared against. Because relativity makes the assumption that the speed of light is constant for every observer. Technically every inertial observer, but that doesn't matter too much. But here's the important thing. These two expressions, the classical momentum and the relativistic momentum are clearly different. And those of you that have ever studied relativity or even heard a bit about it watching popular science videos, check out some links to some relativity videos I've made. But those of you that have studied relativity in any way will know that it's full of counterintuitive ideas, ideas that go against common sense. So for the sake of this explanation, let's say that the common sense definition of momentum is the classical one and the counterintuitive or not so common sense definition is the relativistic one. This is the one that defies logic supposedly and goes against intuitive ideas that we have in our head about how this universe should behave. But let's remember that common sense not only comes from the experiences that we have as individuals in our lifetimes, but from millennia of inherited instincts from our ancestors. In many ways, common sense is only common because it helped our ancestors and even us to this day survive in situations that we're most likely to experience. And when it comes to relativity, like I said earlier, there's a scaling factor, which happens to be the speed of light. This is a very, very, very fast speed. And until the advent of special and general relativity, we hadn't even thought about traveling at speeds close to that. In some ways, our collective human experiences were kind of like us taking the train from our home stop to our work stop and not taking any further and trying to make a judgment about the train based on solely the data that we had from that short journey. We never had any chance or reason for that matter to explore the rest of the train journey. 
so the conclusions that we came to about the train journey were based on limited experiences. Now, relativity becomes very, very important when dealing with objects moving extremely fast, a significant proportion of the speed of light. But what does it tell us about the objects moving at speeds that we're used to? Because if you remember, objects moving at speeds that we were used to gave us this momentum equation, the classical one. And so we can try and work out what special relativity tells us about objects moving at these speeds. For example, if we take a Formula One car moving at its fastest speed, something like 250, 260 miles per hour, I think, which in meters per second ends up being something like 111 meters per second. This is just a rough ballpark figure. We don't need to be exact with this. I realize, first of all, that Formula One cars are not day-to-day -day experience for most people. And secondly, of course, things like planes move much faster. But 111 meters per second is a good rough estimate for the fastest speeds that we have to deal with as human beings. Other extremely fast things are on a similar order of magnitude. And the point is that this speed is still much, much, much slower than the speed of light. And we can take this speed and plug it into our relativity equation and tell us what relativity says about objects that are moving pretty slowly on a relativistic scale. So if we plug in 111 meters per second for the velocity v, and if we plug in 3 times 10 to the power of 8, or 300 million meters per second for the speed of light, which is what it is, it's a constant in special relativity, then we see that this fraction here is a very, very, very small quantity. Even if we were to think about objects that were 10 times or 100 times faster than this, this fraction would still be a very, very small quantity. Compared to the speed of light, let's face it, most things are pretty slow. But then if this fraction takes a very small value, then 1 minus that value must be very, very, very close to 1. And so the square root of this entire quantity must also be very, very, very close to 1. Not quite exactly, but it's close enough to 1 that we can't tell the difference, or at least we couldn't, with the experimental measurements that we had at the time. And so we see that for low velocities, the relativistic equation for momentum reduces to the classical equation for momentum. And this is a good thing, because this tells us that if we consider the same scenarios as classical physics did back in the day, then relativistic physics and classical physics give us the same results. And classical physics is actually very good at describing the universe when objects aren't moving particularly quickly, at least relative to the speed of light. However, when classical physics breaks down, when objects are moving at high velocities, for example, particles in a particle accelerator, that's when we take the relativistic result, which gives us an accurate representation of what's going on at all velocities. Now, there are two things I can say about this. First of all, what I've described here is a common, neat little trick in the world of physics. Does this theory that I'm working on, this mind-bending, weird, counterintuitive theory that I think describes the universe really well, does this theory reduce to classical physics under the right conditions? Because we know that in certain circumstances, classical physics is a good description of our universe. So if this counterintuitive theory does reduce to classical physics under the right conditions, then this is a good sign. Partly because it tells us that classical physics is not inconsistent with the new theory that we're developing under the right circumstances, and partly because it tells us that our theory has a good chance of describing the universe pretty well, at least on those scales, and then we can test it for, for scales that we haven't tried before. The same happens with quantum mechanics, by the way. It deals with objects on a very, very small scale, like much smaller than what we're used to in day-to-day -day life. And it tells us some very counterintuitive things about these objects on a very small scale. But then if we start thinking about slightly larger objects and apply quantum mechanics to them, does the quantum description of those objects start to match the classical description that we came up with millennia ago? And in quantum physics, this question, broadly speaking, has its own name. It's known as the correspondence principle. Under the right conditions, we won't talk about the particular conditions, quantum mechanics must reduce to classical mechanics. I highly recommend you look up the correspondence principle on like Wikipedia or something. It's actually really cool, but I'm not going to talk about it too much here. The second thing that I want to mention regarding the little substitution that we did earlier, where we showed that for low velocities, relativistic momentum looks like classical momentum, is that in many ways it matches our train journey analogy. It tells us a few things. The model that we devised initially by taking the train only from our home stop to our office stop which said that the train wasn't a very busy train, was a very valid model for us to devise based on the experiences that we had or the data that we had. We only took the train from our home stop to the office stop. But we weren't looking at the full picture. And what's more is that the fact that the train could get very, very busy as we got closer to the city centre might have even been very strange to somebody who was taking this hypothetical train. They may not know that city centres get very busy. They might not even have any idea that city centres are the thing to be looking out for when talking about how busy a train gets. 
in the same way that classical physicists back in the day would not have even realized that the velocity of an object was something worth considering. And lastly, having traveled the entire length of the train journey, we had to scrap our old model and come up with a new one. One which said that as the train got closer to the city center, it got busier and busier. But crucially, that model should have given almost identical results to our previous model when considering the journey between our home stop and the office stop. In other words, on that part of the train journey, our new model should have still said that train's not very busy. This is where our new model reduces to our original model under the right circumstances or conditions. Anyway, this is just a silly analogy and I'm sure it breaks down somewhere, so let's not think too deeply about it. Like I said, this kind of logic is constantly applied to counterintuitive theories in physics. Does it reduce down to classical physics under the right conditions? And if not, why not? What does this tell us about classical physics and what does this tell us about our counterintuitive theory? And with all of that being said, I'm going to end this video here. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please do leave a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Hit the bell button if you want to be notified every time I upload. As always, leave a comment down below telling me what topics you'd like me to make videos about, or just leave a comment about my hair, I guess. And of course, as always, if I've made a mistake, please do let me know. I'll try and correct it in the comments as quickly as possible. Oh yeah, check out my second channel as well where I release some music. Recently I've put out a new track of mine, so do go check it out if you're interested. And follow me on Instagram at PathVlogs. All that being said, guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you really soon.